Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming uh, uh, to today's discussion of, uh, I think, a very important topic that more people need to pay attention to. Um, uh, my name is Michael Ryan. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation. I've, um, uh, I won't repeat what's in my short bio, but um, my main interest has been on, on jihadist groups, strategy, I wrote a book in 2013 on decoding al-Qaeda strategy, you know, based on, on their own documents and, and what they, they hope to obtain and how they hope to obtain it. Um, and this morning in the panels, we, we saw uh, Yemen uh, in its factional uh, glory. We saw it in its regional uh, glory. We, we saw it with the problems that it's facing now because of, of, the, of the, the war. Uh, we saw the problems, uh, some of the history of the problems and how they changed, uh, how the relationships among the various groups and the rise of sectarianism, how that had changed. Uh, and we had a focus on some of the humanitarian concerns, which I think, uh, to me, uh, is the most, personally, is the most important problem right now. And the, the second panel, I think, got it reconciliation, which is uh, starting with that before you even get to a political solution, a reconciliation. Uh, this panel today, uh, with, with uh, uh, three of my uh, distinguished colleagues and, and on most days friends, um, uh, uh, basically um, are looking at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, uh, and you can see from, I won't repeat their bios, but, but um, basically um, uh, Alex Vitanka to my right is, is steeped in Iran uh, we did, we, and, and Iranian issues as well as regional issues uh, from a, a, a strategic and political point of view. Uh, and, and he can probably give us more, uh, a deeper look at, at Iran's interests, um, uh, such as they are um, in, in Yemen and the region in general. Um, uh, we have um, uh, uh, basically then Brian Perkins, who, who of course is, has uh, looks more at militant groups and how they fit together and how they interact with one another uh, on a wide scale and, and has, has a, a deep uh, 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 background in this, but we'll be looking at it from, I think, that point of view more. And, and uh, Rafi Jabouri, uh, who, as you can see, has the uh, uh, dis distinction of having worked in and working in, in uh, journalism, uh, it may be more articulate than the rest of us. Uh, but uh, he also is is deeply uh, uh, engaged in analysis of uh, of Iraq, uh, but also of Syria and the factions and the and the dynamic uh, pushes and pulls of, of those situations. And and that's a, a deep knowledge that he brings uh, also to to the issue of Yemen. Uh, so I will ask each of my uh, each of my uh, uh, panelists to uh, spend 15 uh, minutes or so. Um, I will cut them off. Uh, we hope we have enough time for questions and answers. Um, but we will begin uh, at first uh, uh, with uh, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Alex Vitanka. Alex. Thank you very much, Michael. <clears throat> um, thanks again to Jamestown Foundation for the kind invite. Let me start off by saying I spend most of my time looking at Iranian affairs. So I'm not going to claim to tell you much about what's going on on the ground in Yemen. But when uh, Glenn asked me to participate on the panel, um, I had another good look at what's out there in terms of Iranian sources. What are Iranian sources telling us in terms of Iran's ambitions, strategic thinking about Yemen? And I have to tell you, as it has happened to me previously, I came short. Uh, I don't find much being said in either Iranian official media or in the vast Iranian diaspora sources on this issue. Um, and I don't think it's because of censorship or some kind of a hidden agenda that they don't want to share with us. I've come to conclude that they really don't have a long-term plan for Yemen. And on that point, I might have people push back and say, you're wrong on that. And I'm more than happy to have that conversation. But I don't see, um, I don't see the, um, the rationale being laid out. I see the rationale being laid out when it comes to Iran's involvement in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, much more uh, forcefully than I do in the case of Yemen. 
But before we get to that, let me just sort of share with you what the Iranian narrative as of today is, and we can take it forward. Um, the narrative com coming from Tehran is, when it comes to Yemen, that 1979 changed everything and Khamenei's Islamist message begins to attract the Yemenis. That's the narrative that, if you look at what, uh, what the Iranians are saying is being put out there. But the reality, this is not true. Yemen has never really been a factor in Iran's calculations, certainly not in the 80s or in 1990s. And I think uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who himself is a Zaidi, was not cultivated in any serious way based on the evidence that I can find on the Iranian side by the Iranians. He was seen as someone in, firmly uh, grounded in the Arab camp and kind of left alone. Um, again, Yemen was never part of Iran's core mission to recruit like-minded Islamists. The idea that the Iranians were out there recruiting Yemenis, Zaidis, to sort of join the campaign never really uh, takes uh, off in the 80s and 90s. Sure, there are small groups of Zaidis, such as Hossein uh, al-Houthi, who, who uh, visited Iran in the 1990s. But again, to me, that doesn't represent anything uh, groundbreaking. So I want to come to the point about when does things really uh, change, and that's the spring of 2011 and the fall of Saleh in 2012. That's when really you see the Iranians sensing an opportunity here, that we can go in, we can be uh, players. And that's when the word Yemen is in inserted in the axis of resistance. Now, when I look at the issue of axis of resistance, I compare it to the likes of Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I say to myself, well, in Lebanon, you really have depth as Iran. You've been there since 1982. You created it. There are 12 or Shias. There are ideologically believers in the Vilayat al -Fari. There is real depth that you can't take away. I look at what's going on in Yemen. I don't see that depth. I don't see the Iranians being able to convert the Zaidis to 12 or Shia Islam. Now, I apparently I missed it, but this morning there's suggestions some of that is going on. I would love to learn more about it. But certainly on the Iranian side, not much is being put out there in terms of why that mission might be important. They don't usually do that anyways, even in cases of Syria, but there's almost uh, no discussion on that point um, about converting Zaidis to 12 or Shia Islam in um, in Yemen by the Iranians. So my conclusion in many ways, when it comes to, to what Iran is doing in Yemen is, it's as simple as we all kind of have known for so, for, for so long. It's a low cost opportunity for Iranians to give the Saudis a bloody nose. It doesn't cost them much in terms of what they're investing financially. Um, they haven't lost many members of the armed forces as far as I know compared to the 500 or 50 or so that they've lost in Syria, um, or the dozens they've lost in Iraq since 2011. Um, the one thing they have in common when I look at the axis of resistance, Hezbollah, the, the Iraqi Shia militiamen, and the, um, and the uh, Houthis in, in Yemen, and I guess this is where I want to sort of suggest for us to start thinking in terms of policy options. The one thing they have in common is that they all look to Iran when there was a power vacuum. When there's a power vacuum in the early 1980s in Lebanon, Hezbollah is created with, with the huge help of the Iranians. When there's power vacuum in Iraq after 2003 and the invasion of, uh, of that country by the United States, you have the emergence of Shia political parties that are tied to Iran. When Arab Spring happens and Saleh falls, the Iranians turn to Yemen and look, and look at an opportunity, and they have been chasing that opportunity. But I want to emphasize what I said before. It's a low-cost operation for them. They're not investing in terms of money, billions of dollars in Yemen. I am not one of those people who, who believes that the, um, the concept of you know, uh, hurting Saudi Arabia from Yemen, so-called underbelly of Saudi Arabia, is a... Uh, a um, a, a, a top priority for, for the Iranian um, state. And when I look at Iran today, if I'm a, inside the government of Iran, you're in Syria, you're in Lebanon, you're in Iraq, you have to be in Afghanistan. How much can you, um, in terms of resources, allocate towards Yemen? Um, and that, to me, the answer to that, and I say this in the context of, context of the sanctions also being in, in place on Iran. Simply put, the Iranians don't have the capacity right now to do much when it comes to Yemen. 
which on the question of, so what's Iran really doing in Yemen then? As I said, I don't think it's a question of recruiting people to their version of Shia Islam. There is an element of trying to um, shape their ideological outlook, and they succeeded to some extent since the 1990s. Clearly, when you look at the, um, the Houthi slogans, you see Iranian um, influences right there. But what I think Iran, above all, wants out of Yemen and what it's doing in Yemen is to create leverage for itself. And that leverage is aimed at, unfortunately, if you're sitting in the region, if you're sitting in Riyadh or Abu, Abu Dhabi, that leverage isn't created to start discussions with the Saudis or the Emiratis. That's leverage created to discuss this issue and Iran's regional role with the likes of the Europeans and the Americans, perhaps, in the future. So you have the Iranians talk to the Europeans on four occasions about how to bring about a political settlement in, in Yemen. They have had none of those discussions with the Emiratis, with the, with the Saudis, the key, obviously, adversaries in the, in the conflict in, in Yemen. Um, I say the, the point of leverage is important because it tells us a lot about what makes the Iranians, um, how they calculate their steps going forward. When the Trump administration came in, the Iranians were worried about losing leverage. When the Trump administration left the nuclear agreement, they were almost panic-stricken in terms of lack of leverage. What could they do from their perspective to get the Trump administration's um, attention? And therefore, to me, it wasn't a coincidence that you started seeing overt Iranian admission of being in Yemen after the Trump administration comes to the White House, after the nuclear deal uh, is one that the United States walks away from looking for leverage, that's the moment to start bringing the Yemen card up and saying, you know what, we could perhaps help bring about a political settlement here. Um, when you look at the country of Yemen from Iran's perspective, because the Iranian narrative today will tell you there is historic proximity, there's cultural proximity, and so on and so forth. As I said earlier, none of that is true. Iran was never really involved in Yemen even when the Shah was involved in the 60s and 70s on the side of the monarchist, Iran's involvement was limited. Um, in the 80s, Iran was busy fighting the Iraqis. Yemen was not on the radars. Um, and today, Yemen, from an Iranian perspective, what could it bring? Could it be something ideological? Could Iran genuinely consider Yemen as fertile ground where it can bring about proxy militiamen and create them and ar arm them and lead them the way they've done in Iraq? I don't see any evidence of that. And as I said, Iran has been explicitly admitting to having been in, in Yemen now since 2015. And we know it was there as soon as um, Ali Saleh fell in 2012. And yet we don't see the evidence of, of this mass mobilization of Zaidi Yemenis under the Iranian um, flag. There are cases of Hosseiniyaz, uh, Shia uh, places of worship, but that to me just doesn't cut it. Uh, I don't think that amounts to strategic thinking. A country of 28 million people, poor as Yemen is, what is Iran going to do in terms of long-term planning and being involved in Yemen? Do they have the funds to be a player? I don't think anybody seriously in Tehran will consider Yemen a place worth investing in from their perspective. It's not next door. It's not Afghanistan. It's not Iraq. Yemen is too far away. Uh, it would be a hard sell to the Iranian people right now to say we have to go and be involved in Yemen. I don't think this Iranian administration right now has any space to chase anything like that. Um, so, I, And I, I'm afraid I have to repeat the same message again to you. When I look at it is. Um, the axis of, of resistance is obviously real, but when you look at the components of the so-called axis of resistance, you got the Hezbollahs, you got the Iraqis, you got Assad, and then you got the Houthis, Ansar Allah. Well, to me, the Houthi part just doesn't really go f nicely with the rest of them. It's, it's a part of the axis of resistance that if you push the Iranians hard enough and you, ask, you demanded concessions, that's the sort of, if you will, a low-hanging fruit. That's the one where they can uh, come to the table and negotiate with because they don't really have good, solid reasons to want to be in Yemen. They, under different circumstances, had Iran not been under sanctions, had they, had they more money or perhaps uh, more um, uh, public support for it back in Iran, which they don't have, they could have acted differently in Yemen. But right now, with the 
constraints they're under, the limited resources they have to play with, and where else they're involved. They haven't finished their projects in Lebanon, they haven't finished the project in Syria or Iraq, and Yemen would represent an overreach and a dangerous one for that. Um, so I think, um, um, bless you. Um, I think what, what Iran right now wants, and I, Michael, I'll stop there. Maybe you have a follow-up question for me. Um, what Iran seems to want is to have itself remain at the table, if you will, as a relevant actor that has to be counted on to play a role in the regional and international uh, time of seeking a political settlement for the future of Yemen. In the meantime, the Iranians are happy to have Yemen be a source to bleed the Saudis because they, from an Iranian perspective, what they're doing is sort of returning the favor. They're, they're, they don't see this as, uh, as them being uh, provocative. They're, from an Iranian perspective, they're just returning the favor. They, they, um, they will tell you, if you ask an Iranian official, they'll tell you, well, you know, um, what we're doing in Yemen is no different than the, 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 the policies against Iran that the um, Saudis or the Emiratis are, are pursuing. So you, you have an, uh, an opportunity, perhaps, and I'm being very optimistic, I, um, I'm, I, I grant you that much, but there is an opportunity, perhaps, to, to um, consider a role for Iran to play, given that uh, they do want to play that role when the conditions are right. Um, and last point I make is whatever U U.S. and obviously allies, Saudi Arabian Emirates, do in, in, in Yemen, whatever we do, we should not go down the path of dividing the conflict into the Shias and the Sunnis, which this town often does. <clears throat> I think what should happen instead is to highlight uh, the radical ideological elements that some of the Houthis have picked up from Iran and oppose those. Uh, but we shouldn't describe it as a Shia-Sunni conflict because whenever we've done that, our allies have done that in the region, um, what you have is the Iranians automatically benefit because sort of the Houthis would have nobody to turn to or run to other than, on, than Iran, exactly what happened with the Iraqi Shias since 2003. And, in, and in a, look at it differently, look how in many ways uh, successful it's been since um, the UAE and Saudi Arabia decided to actually open a new chapter and talk to Shia Arab uh, counterparts in Iraq. Uh, that, I think, is, is the way forward that would undermine Iran's um, overall overarching message that what you have in the Middle East today is a fight between good Muslims, if you will, and the United States and what they call uh, the, the Zionist entity, Israel, obviously, you can undermine that um, overarching Iranian argument by, um, by making sure you don't tackle the issue from a sectarian perspective, but from the perspective of what is it that Iran really is peddling here. Uh, and fundamentally, if you, if you look at the Iranian message, the idea of the supreme leadership, um, it's not a very attractive message. It shouldn't have much um, or shouldn't be able to find much fertile ground a place in Yemen. Um, and I don't think it will if the right policies are pursued um, uh, against, um, against what Iran is doing in Yemen. Let me stop there, Michael, and, and maybe have your reaction. Well, I, I think uh, what I'd prefer to do, Alex, is, okay. is continue with our presentation to leave sure. the maximum amount of time for the Q's and A's. So I'd like to uh, turn uh, directly to Brian Perkins, who's going to talk about uh, the role and implications of AQAP and IS um, in Yemen's war. Um, Brian is, is very well placed to, to, to deliver this, and, and uh, so take it away, Brian. All right. Um, so excuse me, there's a bunch of notes I took from the, the panels before. I want to make sure I hit some notes. Um, so the, the war in Yemen has had a really interesting effect on, on terrorist groups within the country. Saw Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula surge early on after the war and has slowly receded some. Uh, we also saw the emergence of the Islamic State branch and not just one branch, but they had announced their presence in several different governorates. They announced uh, in Aden, Abyan, Hadramat, uh, Ib, and Taiz was one tied together. And all of these provinces, and as the war's gone on, they've been pushed into one governorate that they're working out of. 
So the war basically, it's been detrimental to both groups in many ways, but beneficial in others. And those benefits are going to be more pronounced in the long term, whenever a peace, especially whenever a peace settlement comes. Um, we'll get into Al Qaeda and kind of what their operations have looked like. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right. So, like I said, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula surged pretty early on in the war. It managed to take control of a lot of areas. Uh, some of the key areas were Mukalla, large portions of, of Hydramat, Shabwa, Abiyan, um, and into Al Beda. So, if you see the map on the left, this was not all of the operations, but more of the claimed operations. If you see how spread out that is, that was from 2014 to June 2018. And the reason I, I stopped this at, at June 2018 is shortly after is when uh, they started clashing with the Islamic State. Then from June 2018 to present, this is what we're looking at as far as operations. What we have there in red is Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And in yellow, that's where the Islamic State has been pushed to. So if we look back to 2011, a similar thing happened. Uh, AQAP surged and took control of a lot of the same areas that they did more recently, ultimately to get pushed back later on. But the big difference between 2011, that era of AQAP, and the difference now is that in 2011, while the government and the military's attention was elsewhere, they were left in largely kind of ungoverned territory. There wasn't active military or uh, counterterrorism campaigns against them at that point in time. What we have in 2015 is a real multi-sided battle space. So Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is facing more fronts than they're, than they're used to, more fronts than they did in 2011. They've been facing off against the Houthis, against hadi aligned government or military brigades. They've been facing UAE-backed security forces, uh, tribes that are unwilling to uh, work with them anymore, especially after Saudi Arabia and the UAE have been paying select tribes to step away from them. They've also faced uh, a resurgence of drone strikes, and more recently, they've been clashing with the Islamic State. So they don't really have the same space that they used to have to operate and to hold on to these territories. And despite the troubles that the UAE-backed security forces, their establishment, despite the long-term implications of them, uh, they have been relatively effective at pushing Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula out of a lot of the territories that they were in. And not necessarily, doesn't point to necessarily their efficiency as military units as much as, you know, Al-Qaeda leaving Mukalla was part of the, their military strategy. It was also part uh, a tactical retreat. Um, what we've seen is they've tactically retreated into to more remote locales and areas where they can operate a little bit more smoothly, They're looking to rebuild after a lot of uh, their leadership's been, been cut off and killed. They have uh, significant communications problems. Um, and then the Islamic State, that's become a more significant thing recently, fighting between them. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. Um, the Islamic State's presence in, in Yemen is interesting. Um, on the surface, if you were to look at all of, the, all of the different countries that the Islamic State has managed to expand to, um, kind of take root in, there's a lot of commonalities in the situation between those countries where it's it's been successful in Yemen. Uh, look at kind of all the places taken root in Yemen. Uh, defunct militaries and, and governments, large swaths of ungoverned territory, poor rule of law, um, sectarian issues, and then, you know, other fault lines, whether it's tribal, ethnic, or just when you look at all of those, it would on the surface seem like Yemen shares a lot in common and it could be a place uh, that the Islamic State could grow. But the Islamic State has faced a lot of challenges as well and its expansion and its presence there. Um, and there's, there's multiple reasons, but I want to hit on a few. First, they're facing a lot of the same challenges that Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is. They're facing resistance from all sides. They can't, they're not going to go into an active 
battlefront between coalition forces and airstrikes and everything like that. It doesn't do them much good for expansion. It's just going to get them killed. Um, so they're being pushed into areas where there's less active fronts, just like Al Qaeda. Um, number two, the sectarian divide, like we've talked about before, it just doesn't exist in Yemen the way that it exists in the other locations. Um, despite what, like how the media has described it, it's not quite the same. It's not as deep as in other places, but it's moving more and more that di direction. It's becoming uh, more sectarian. Each group is framing it more that way to mobilize forces. And the longer it drags on, the, the worse it's gonna get. Um, another other thing we talked about sectarianism and then different fault lines, whether it's ethnic or religious. Um, one of the bigger fault lines in, in Yemen is the north-south divide. But unlike other fault lines in other countries, that fault line has never kind of generated the you know, raw hatred or genocidal violence that other ethnic or religious fault lines have in a lot of the countries that the Islamic State those are things that they can't play off of nearly as well as they could play off of in places like uh, post-war Iraq, in Syria, in Nigeria, where you're seeing all of those deep, deep, long-standing tribal disputes that have generated that type of violence. That hasn't been the case in Yemen. Uh, another, another main point is Yemen also doesn't have the history of obscene violence perpetrated against civilians. A lot of the countries the Islamic State has, and I'm not talking about uh, you know indiscriminate airstrikes. What I'm talking about is you know beheadings and crucifixions or brutal machete attacks that kill women and children and wipe out entire villages. That hasn't been a feature of Yemeni society. So when the Islamic State started doing those things, it took everyone by surprise, and it's not something that pretty much anyone supports. And frankly, there's little tolerance for it within even the more hardline groups within Yemen. So when those things happened, even Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula put out all kinds of statements. That's just generally not something, a tactic that Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula has used. They have trouble getting support because of those tactics. Um, or unlike uh, Al Qaeda, the Islamic State has attempted several times to draw in foreign recruits fight for them in Yemen. And foreign fighters have never really been a component of the, the terrorist scene in Yemen. Uh, Al-Qaeda, of course, has trained and worked with Al-Shabaab members. But as far as foreign fighters within Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, there's very few. Um, and an important part to note is that Al-Qaeda's success is in their ability to attach themselves to local grievances take them on as their own. They've married within tribes. And in order to get support from the tribe or even just acquiescence, because it's not always support. A lot of times it's just, we don't have the will to fight you. You're helping us. You can stay here. Doesn't mean they actively support them. But in order to gain that, you really have to, the groups have to know the local context, not just what the context is now. They have to know the historical context of each area they're working in. What have been the disputes that this specific tribe has had over the past several years? What are their grievances? What do they need? And understanding how they work. Um, and a lot of the Islamic State fighters are not Yemeni at all, or they're operating in governorates that they're not from. Um, and that makes a big difference if you have, you know, inter governorate rivalries and you have Islamic State fighters coming in with these bizarre tactics, um, all this brutal violence, they're coming in and they're trying to get support from a local tribe, but they're not even from the area. All of those things combined, it, it leads to, to them gaining very little support. So, but despite seeing, seeing this decline from where they were operating, all the way just now into that one small piece of Al-Beta, they're still resilient there. They're, I don't see them being defeated anytime soon because really the only, uh, the only active fights and things that they're dealing with directly targeting them is drone strikes and they've increasingly clashed with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, 
they've just been engaging in tit for tat attacks between the two of them, uh, kidnappings, and then they've also been engaged in fast. Uh, they've been engaged in a in a broader rhetorical battle, trying to frame themselves as the more righteous or as the legitimate protectors of of the tribes. Um, so I don't see either of these two groups kind of defeating each other, or significantly diminishing each other. Um, but what I have seen is that Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula definitely still maintains the upper hand as far as support from tribes or getting them to um, help when it serves both Al Qaeda and the tribe. For instance, another tactic the Islamic State used, they blew up a well. If you blow up a well in a, in a tribal area, that's, that's important. That's, that goes against how are you ever going to get support from them? So in response to that, the tribe was actually helping to hunt down Islamic State leaders. So you might see a small gain for Al Qaeda, but over the long run, um, the Islamic State's presence, I don't see it disappearing. It's going to pose yet another security challenge for, um, for Yemen. Um, and then if we look at what happens if there is a cessation of hostilities? So that'll have several implications on Al Qaeda and the Islamic State. And the extent of those implications will, of course, depend on kind of what the scenario is, what the settlement looks like. And we obviously don't have time to walk through all of those, but we can cover kind of the implications shared by most potential outcomes. Um, one key aspect to me that I think is becoming in increasingly clear that Yemen is probably unlikely to ever be put back together in the same united fashion that it used to be. It's going to have to be, in my mind, there's going to be some sort of changes, whether it's uh, session or more federalism. It's never going to be put back and united the way it was before, not that it was exceptionally united then. Um, the same goes for the military. Uh, with all of these differing factions within the actual military itself fighting on opposing sides, all the different proxy forces and Salafi militias and UAE backed forces, I don't see them ever integrating into one single and being effective across the country. Um, and then you look at all the different governments in the former PDRY, they all want kind of different things. I don't see them wanting to be united. And that's not to say all of those governments want the same thing. I mean, what they want in Aden differs from what the people in Lukala want, and that differs from what people in more northern portions of Hyderabad want. Um, then there's Almira, and that's completely different. But the fact is, trying to integrate all of these different security forces is going to be extremely difficult. So really what we're going to have is uh, a bunch of regional military forces that will be dead set on securing their interests in their home. Whatever their interests are, they're going to use their, their training and their arms to try to secure those interests. Meanwhile, the uh, military commanders and the prominent political players are going to be focusing their energy on positioning themselves for maximum authority through whatever that deal is, and then working on rebuilding governance structures. So with no single security authority across the country, and in some cases, there might not be a single one covering an entire government. Um, and then also, with the cessation of hostilities from all the other groups, Al Qaeda is going to have more operational space. And then you're going to see the return of fighters who've been fighting with all the different militias, have picked up a more sectarian tinge to their ideas, if you have Salafi militias who've been fighting against the Houthis, they're going to be probably more receptive to that type of sectarian conversation and more susceptible going to Al Qaeda or the Islamic State. And then also, when these militias do return to their towns or, or whatever, they're going to be extremely war weary and they're probably not going to. Uh, have the energy or the desire to kick Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula out of their country, especially if they come back to find that for the past year or so, Al Qaeda is engaged in public works pro like projects in their town. They're going to be a little bit less inclined to kick them out the way they might have been before. And then, of course, there's the ones who've been drawing salaries from whoever's paying them to fight, whether it's the UAE, whether it's the government. <clears throat> 
they're going to come back and not necessarily have those salaries anymore. Uh, depending on you know their skills or what their situation is, if Al Qaeda is there and offers them a salary, that's a potential that that many of these people will will get that. Um, so then also when the conflict does end, you'll see a prioritization of um, you know efforts to resume basic public services and to rebuild. It's going to be prioritized around areas with very large population centers and key strategic cities and locations. Uh, and that's going to come, you know, at a disadvantage to the smaller, more rural communities where Al Qaeda is, is in a stronger position. So that's going to set them up to, while everything else is being rebuilt in all of these larger population centers, <clears throat> everyone's going to be watching their smaller, more rural towns wither away still, and that'll give Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula the opportunity to engage in those public works projects and public services, whether it's related to, if you look at Rikala, they did beach cleanup days and things like that. And service delivery notably actually improved under Al Qaeda for a short period of time. And that's something that people, you know, they didn't really want them there, but they did appreciate having quicker access to water electricity. So with all of those areas not being prioritized, that's going to lead to them growing and expanding even further. Um, and then if you look at the Islamic State, these are these are learning organizations. If the Islamic State, if Al Qaeda is able to move once there is a cessation of hostilities, maybe the Islamic State won't be forced into a pocket where they have to fight against Al Qaeda anymore. Maybe they can find more fertile ground elsewhere. Maybe they shift their tactics and become less like brutal and against kind of what Yemenis expect. And then they could certainly grow and expand as well. They'll also be seeing the return of, of fighters also. The conflict dragging on, it might continue to kind of keep AQAP and IS at bay or from rapidly expanding. Um, but over the long term, the conditions that would allow both of them to grow are only going to uh, ripen as the war drags on. Uh, so the humanitarian situation is just going to become more dire. All of these social schisms are going to expand, and the military is going to become more fractured. And that's about it. I'm way over. But. No. <laughs> you're not way over. You're way under. I mean, we could go on all day. Um, thank you, Brian. I appreciate that very much. Uh, next speaker, Rafid Jabouri, uh, the critical position of South Yemen um, uh, in the Yemen war and, and the players and parties and proxies. Rafid, please. Thank you. Nine years ago, there was a Jamestown Foundation conference about Yemen. I was also a member of the late afternoon panel. And I think one of the <laughs> questions that came in from the audience after uh, what should the, the U.S. do with President Saleh? How much? And I volunteer to answer, change him. Everyone, mm -hmm. the Iraq war was very fresh. First months of the Obama administration, a president who campaigned against war intervention. And then I had to come in very quickly. I'm sorry, uh, I think I was loud enough. Uh, and then uh, I had to, um, I had to um, elaborate saying that actually, you know, they, the US needs to convince him to change. And I still hold that line. Uh, I think Yemen is very important to uh, the American national security. In comparison, it's way more important and relevant in terms of American national security than countries like Syria or Libya, for example, talking about the Arab Spring, of course, context. So uh, the way the US dealt with what happened after uh, 2010, which was the time of our conference, is that you know it delegated the solution of the Yemen crisis or the Yemen revolution or the Yemen settlement transition from Saleh to what came next to the regional uh, powers, to the GCC. And uh, when you do that, you most likely get regional powers pushing for their own interests, which are not uh, necessarily same as uh, the US. So uh, here we are. Um, with me focusing again about the South because that's where uh, that's where Al Qaeda is actually that's where the jihadists are. Uh, although some of the most of their leaders are not from the South necessarily, but in the South they found uh, they found uh, you know their um, ideal base in Yemen and uh, 
elsewhere. So why the South matter as far as I'm concerned? Uh, jihadist geopolitics and history. Jihadists, I'll say, I've said a little bit and I'll say more later, but uh, of course, uh, since the inception of, of Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula in 2009, most of its activities, most of its bases were in the South, from, from the South. Um, and I think, uh, I think you would agree with your pattern. That's, you know, uh, as I said, not necessarily the leaders are from the South, but that's, you know, the reason is that the environment was very suitable. Uh, you have highlighted some of the main reasons for that. But of course, I'll be focusing more about the southern, the southern question, the, the, the question of South Yemen, uh, the uh, former uh, South Yemen, of course, which was a country between 1967 and 1990. So actually, you know, for those who are not familiar, southern Yemen, former southern Yemen, was actually included south and east Yemen provinces. So the the Yemeni uh, the Yemeni women and uh, ladies and gentlemen will have to excuse me because I'll I'll talk about uh, things that are very familiar about their history but uh, it's very important to highlight you know uh, parts of the history of of South Yemen which was ruled by a social the social the the Yemeni Socialist Party the Marxist uh, party the only Marxist uh, government in the in the Arab world uh, from the late 1960s until the unification. So there was, of course, uh, you know, the independence of uh, southern Yemen in 1967, um, few civil wars with the north, uh, the Marxist factor and the tribal factor playing together, but of, of course, different history than the north. Um, 1990, unification has been always, although now we listen to the narrative of southern secessionist saying, you know, about, talking about the distinct identity of the South or Arab South. But of course, you know, the unification has been always an aspiration for Yemenis, for most Yemenis, in the, whether in the North or in the South. So when it's happened in the 1990, uh, it was a matter of optimism and, and, and celebration. The, the Marxist regime in the, in, the, uh, in the South was, of course, in crisis for two main reasons, the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and its support, and, but also the internal, uh, the internal wars, rivalries, uh, between the leaders of that uh, of that regime, and of course, you know, most famously, the civil war in the 1986. Um, southern grievances after the unification in 1990 grew more. So we had the elections of 1993, which was again, you know, very well organized. It was celebrated, but the result was a civil war, as most of the southerners who voted for the former ruling party, the uh, Socialist Party uh, supported, you know, the leaders of the of the of the party uh, claimed that you know there was discrimination again and lack of integration and equality, and there was a civil war that ended with uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh winning, uh, of course, using the significant help of the Islamists uh, in the south. And since then, there were even more grievances in the south, which developed into the southern secessionist movement in the late uh, 2000s, which of course emerged again uh, after the Arab Spring and the Yemen Revolution of 2011. So uh, here there is a challenge, of course, always a challenge to the binary nature of, uh, the perceived binary nature of, of the conflict in Yemen between the, uh, the, the, the legitimate government and the Houthis, of course, the Southerners have a claim that they are a party, and not a, not only a claim they they develop that into forming the because we 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 talked about the the, the militias, the formation of militias in Yemen. Uh, uh, more significantly, what we are talking about here are militias in the south, or at least that's what I'm interested in. So, the main influences. In, in the region came, of course, from the Arab coalition with its, uh, with its two main players, with its two players, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And I put UAE first because it's, uh, it's more involved, obviously, in the South. Saudi Arabia, we spoke, we highlighted some of the differences between the UAE and the Saudi agenda. We might uh, say a little bit more about it. Uh, and of course, uh, Alex talked about Iran, but I'll say a few other things. 
this is um, again what was um, what was the Republic of South Yemen um, and and North Yemen. Okay, so the Arab coalition was formed to help the illegitimate Yemeni government to uh, roll back, uh, resist the Houthi uh, invasion, the Houthi uh, escalation, and of course the occupation of Sana'a and then Aden. What happened afterwards was very controversial. The Arab coalition was formed, of course, you know, this, this picture probably is from the from the heydays of, of the of the heyday of the of the Arab Spring when Yemen was uh, looking with optimism to the future, where the first Arab woman uh, won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, Tawakul Karman. But Tawakul Karman himself herself years ago called what's happening in Yemen as a Saudi UAE occupation. Not well, that cost her, of course, losing her membership or suspending suspension of her membership in her Islah uh, party, which is now uh, based in Saudi Arabia, as uh, as President Hadi is. But uh, this this uh, this strong words uh, stated what many uh, believe in another divide in the public opinion in Yemen about the role of the UAE and Saudi Arabia in their country, because we know that the Iranian role is in general condemned apart from the supporters of the Houthi. Two main faces of the southern movement uh, right now, which uh, operate under the, the new manifestation, which is the Southern Transitional Council. The gentleman on the right, Aydarus uh, al-Zubaydi, is the chairman of, uh, of the council. Uh, um, there, was a, there was a point that was raised er earlier in the morning by uh, Ms. Hamdani about you know is it what is the STC is it is it it's not it's not a, a just a tool or a stooge of the United Arab Emirates of course I agree about that um, they are not a stooge but they are you know they are a genuine entity but they're also a tool of the UAE uh, policy in Yemen and in particular in southern uh, in southern Yemen uh, so they have their their support uh, they in a, in a very fragmented environment uh, they are the most uh, organized power now, but they still get most of, a significant part of their support from the UAE backing. Um, notably, uh, Al Zubaydi was recently in Russia, a country that, uh, of course, in the past under the Soviet Union had interest in South Yemen, but probably would, we would see renewed Russian interest in Yemen. Um, Probably after the visit, there was also another visit from the Russian ambassador in Sana'a to uh, in, in Sana'a to Aden, to Aden, where he was uh, received and greeted in a, in a celebration where only the southern flags were raised. So Russia apparently is exploring the um, southern Yemen um, environment. <clears throat> Uh, so, as I said, uh, a genuine fighting force, very important fighting force. Why? Because, you know, when, when Aden fell and the Arab coalition was formed and the, uh, the Yemen war started, um, the only significant success, I would say, was the liberation of Aden. And uh, a, a large part of that success came from the southern fighters. Not the as opposed to as opposed to the Yemeni army, so that's you know that's the matter of the pride and the claim of of the STC and other secessionist movement. Secessionist movement. Um, turning to the second gentleman, um, Hani bin Break, more controversial, the deputy uh, chairman of the STC, um, um, previous Salafist who was condemned by fellow Salafists year ago. Uh, but now uh, uh, has uh, power and control in, in the South. There are a lot of ac accusations uh, about the policies of the UAE-backed groups, particularly the SDC, of course, the, the militias that we are talking about. Uh, Han even break is at the center of that. Um, we have accusations of... Uh, running um, secret prisons, whether uh, in conjunction or on behalf of the UAE. 
Uh, and of course, you know, the, uh, we have accusations of to Hannibal and Brecken in particular, but also to the STC uh, uh, of being behind a series of assassinations to uh, clerics, uh, particularly mosque imams who are not, uh, who are either accused of being members of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salah Party, or being Salafists who are not, uh, uh, who are not uh, agreed with with, uh, with the UAE policy or critical to the UAE policy in in Yemen. I think I answered the last question. I think it, they are both the STC is both a genuine movement, but it's also a proxy of the UAE in, in, in Yemen. Uh, jihadist again, Qasem al Rimi is the current. Thank you, Qasem al Rimi is the current uh, is the current leader of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, just to add one thing, I think you mentioned uh, Brian, uh, Al Qaeda uh, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula is is very significant. Uh, um, you know, it also survived ISIS in many regions of the world. You know. Branches of Al Qaeda either uh, either switched allegiance allegiance to ISIS or were defeated uh, by ISIS, but not not in Yemen. That's that's something very important. And when Al Qaeda lost its control of uh, the Al Mukalla, the the regional capital of Hadramaut, they retreated in what was seen as a kind of um, agreement more than fighting. So again, not harmed that much by by major fighting uh, in 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 Al Mukalla, which was which uh, which had become back then uh, uh, a major uh, stronghold of theirs. Um, in, in in 2008, I have to remind myself that in 2008, Al Qaeda was very aware of the of of the nature and the appeal of the southern coast that Nasr al Haishi the previous leader of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula recognized the cause of southern Yemen and called for the southern Yemenis not to listen uh, to the appeal of the former regime, the former socialists, because that was, you know, a road that you know was taken, and then the new road, according to him and Al Qaeda, was the road of jihadists or Islamists. Um, <clears throat> Retreat, as I said, in Mukalla and elsewhere, but uh, always, always possible resurgence in Yemen. Uh, what is the future of the future of the South? Secession um, still uh, seem, uh, seems hard uh, without significant support. Even the UAE, which supports the, uh, the, the, the STC and, and, and to some extent some other uh, secessionist uh, groups, uh, does not seem to be supporting uh, secession. Uh, and there isn't much international support for that too, but it's it's in the people's hearts and it's in, in it's uh, and it's their claim and it's what they, in what they believe in the south. Uh, integration very um, very hard. Um, maybe the, the the federal solution that uh, that came from the, the the national talk that would more or less to put put the south into put the former south into two two uh, two federal autonomous regions might be helped, but most likely the status quo. I think. Uh, more divide and more intervention in, in, in the South and more fragmentation for the Southern groups too. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. That you, you, you got to that just as I was writing my wind-up note, so you saved me one uh, perfect timing. Um, I'd like to, uh, I, I hope we can have a, um, a lively question and answer uh, uh, period. I'd like to start off uh, with a, a, a a question for um, each of our panelists, the same question, uh, which would be um, in all the, 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 the details that you laid out so well, what would you have the one uh, takeaway that you would have for, for our audience today uh, from, from your presentation? What, what would you want them to remember as your key point? Yeah, I know that's an unfair question, but I insist on it anyway. Um, and the and the other thing uh, for for I have an individual question for each for Alex it's it's uh, what kind of role would Iran um, insist on if any in a in a uh, in either a reconciliation or a political settlement conference an international conference on on Yemen um, and for both Brian um, and Rafid it's a similar question. Um, uh, uh, Brian, you, you, you said a very interesting thing, many interesting things, but one thing that caught my attention 
was that some of the local, uh, shall we call them jihadist, Islamist, mujahideen, um, who are local might be more um, open to some of the AQAP uh, uh, ideology. Uh, I think if I, if I understood you correctly. Um, and and I'd, I'd like you to expand on that a little bit, if, if, because I'm looking at, I'm not sure, uh, I'm totally convinced that there is a, a distinction to be made between local jihad and global jihad, but for the moment, let's assume that there is. Um, and and uh, would, these, would these people be open to a more globalist, or would it be just in a local, in a local uh, uh, concept of how you rule locally? Um, and a, a similar question to you, uh, Rafid, uh, would, would be um, uh, the, uh, at the end of the day, I mean, I think, I think you, you laid out a, a very plausible scenario where, where uh, AQAP uh, has a much better chance of surviving. Um, uh, uh, but do you think that they could ever um, change themselves enough uh, so that they wouldn't have a global, um, uh, an overtly global uh, mission uh, to take the crosshairs off their off their backs. Uh, with, if there should be a change in administration, um, and Yemen and this kind of of uh, CT thing became an issue in the United States again. Okay, Alex. Thank you, Michael. I mean, the first one is tough. Um, something to to say that you can take away. I, I would say the following. Um, given the conditions in Iran and the pressures that this regime is under, both internationally and at home, I think it would be fair to say, you know, um, what flows out of the Strait of Hormuz and controlling the Strait of Hormuz is far more important for the Iranians than what happens as Bab al-Mandeb right now. You know, under uh, other conditions, you could have said, you know, they want to be a player down there and at the Bab al-Mandeb, they want to be a player. Uh, in the sudden ends of the Arabian Sea. But when you look at what Iran has to play with right now in its toolbox, I just don't see him being that confident. So it all comes down to the basic cost-benefit uh, analysis. So I would say they are focused on the home front and key foreign policy missions out in the region that they have engaged in, pursued for the last few years. I would probably say Yemen is not a top tier item on that list. Uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon still to me are more, more important. Um, so that's how I would answer it, uh, Michael. In terms of reconciliation and um, Iran's role in it, you know, when I look at the last uh, few decades of the Islamic Republic being in power, uh, when I look at where they have successfully uh, or not engaged in efforts to be part of a political process, Afghanistan in the 1990s with the civil war, Tajikistan in the 1990s with the civil war, Lebanon again, uh, at, at mostly at, at the um, with the Taif agreement and so forth, and ongoing efforts by Iran right now, allegedly in terms of the future of Syria. Those con these are the big ones in terms of where Iran has been involved. And what do they usually have in common? Two things. They have a pretty strong Iranian presence on the ground, an ability to be a, a, a sort of a, a, a formidable play, if you will, with a local actor that, that wants Iran's patronage and support. I'm not sure if the Houthis qualify. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. That's more for uh, Yemen experts in the room to answer. But there's also the willingness of international actors to let Iran be part of a reconciliation process. You know, in Tajikistan, the Russians were happy that Iran was a major player alongside with Russia to be a, a peacemaker, if you will. In Afghanistan, there were no opposition by Pakistan that Iran was involved. And today, because of Iran's ability to be a player on the ground in Syria, uh, and the fact that the Turks and the Russians have accepted Iran as a reality, the Iranians are part of that process. I am not sure if the Saudis and the Emiratis have reached that conclusion about a potential role for Iran in the in a uh, you know reconciliation effort in Yemen. Uh, you know, you would hope they would see the Iranians uh, potentially play a role because if you're sitting in Riyadh, Michael, uh, and you think your assessment is that the um, the Houthis do want an external supporter of sorts to back them up so they can get the best of deals out there. Who other than Iran can be on, on the Houthi side right now? So if Saudi Arabia and UAE could perhaps carve out another entity could, that could play that sort of a role of supporting the, the, the Houthis 
to some extent in a, in a broader pr uh, process aimed at peace. Maybe Oman can play that role. I don't know. But that, those are the types of things that one could, could, could consider. But I would just say, when I mention Afghanistan, Tajikistan, uh, you know, Lebanon and Syria, I wouldn't put Yemen in the same category. I might be wrong in this. I don't see the Iranian presence on the ground to be that formidable. Uh, and therefore, when they don't have leverage, plus the fact most likely the UAE and the Saudis don't want them to have a big role to play, then how can Iran play a big part in reconciliation? That's a question mark. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, so starting, starting with your first question, uh, a main takeaway is look at the operations for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, things have seemingly shrunk. Uh, as far as their capabilities and where they're operating right now or where they're actively operating and have a more visible presence because they are they are present in far more places than that map seems they're just laying low and they're not conducting attacks that are being reported they're not they've been diminished a little bit in their operational capabilities but they're still very much there and uh, the critical moment the longer the war drags on, the more beneficial it's going to be to them because the war is not going to get rid of them, but it's going to create all the conditions to help them grow after. So really the, the critical moment is going to be what happens after the war stops. What is, you know, when there is a settlement, the first like six months to a year is going to be essential that something is done to keep them from filling those vacuums that are going to exist that don't quite exist the way they do now. Of course, there's power vacuums now, but I'm talking about just areas completely forgotten and the rest of the things that they've had to contend with and that have kind of corralled them into those areas. When those things that have kept them in those certain areas are no longer there and they can expand if there's no like appropriate action in terms of military activity or looking for development projects in these areas where a, like AQAP is operating, they're going to expand probably larger than they might have been in the past. Um, as far as the, the local and global thing, what I meant um, more locally uh, was the fighters who've been kind of subjected to or mobilized against the Houthis, not all of them are fighting right in their, their home country. When they, when they return after uh, fighting against the Houthis and being mobilized by this rhetoric against the Houthis, they're probably going to come back a little bit more receptive to the hardline ideology of Al-Qaeda and Arabia, making them a little bit more, more likely to be receptive to that and potentially join. But you brought up something I didn't get a chance to, to point out is another component that's uh, been hindered for Al Qaeda is kind of their their global ambitions. There hasn't been the same uh, focus for them as there has been in the past, and part of that's been all of the things I'm talking about. The, all of the challenges that they've been facing, they haven't been able to focus on on the global. But these returning fighters, if they do join, it might not just be a local thing. They've also been facing Saudi airstrikes, and the United States is obviously tied to the destruction of. Yemen. So if there is like a windfall of, of recruits when there's a political settlement and Al Qaeda does expand, I would expect that they will go back to having their, their global ambitions while still focusing, focusing on, on their local. So the <clears throat> takeaway message, I would say, um, South Yemen is a different problem is a different problem that has a distinct um, identity and it uh, requires a specific um, approach or approaches <clears throat> whether within or out of the whole Yemen uh, problem the AKAP global mission uh, I think uh, I think it's very important for uh, AKAP to uh, keep pushing for being the front runner um, on on the front of uh, global jihad, uh, global jihad is is very. I, I mean, I agree with you. There isn't much um, of a significant difference between local and global, but it it's a matter of.
priority and prioritization. Right. Right. So for them, I think it will be always a priority to be the, you know, holding the banner of global jihad. Um, I asked before them, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria had a choice of, you know, focusing on ruling Iraq and Syria, but they went for uh, global jihad, very important in terms of appeal and, and presence and existence within the jihadi uh, movement. So, and, and of course, AKAP is the more capable branch of Al-Qaeda to compete with ISIS on that front globally. Right. So I think they will also be going for that. If I may quickly talk about uh, the Houthi um, being having the initiatives, all, the initiative all the time. That's, that's a very important dynamic to monitor. Um, uh, no matter, you know, how much the Iranian support or how much, you know, what, what their position is in, in terms of the Iranian geopolitical agenda, they, they made significant gains. Uh, and even, even, even very recently with political moves like the session of the parliament in Seoul and Hadramaut, you know, that was somewhat a response to the Houthis trying to get hold of the Yemeni parliament representation. So even that was a kind of a reaction to, to the Houthi uh, initiative. It's a shame that throughout the day we, we didn't have a chance to analyze President Saleh's factor in, in, in this whole conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, again, as I started by saying, you know, suggesting how to change him or ask him to change or getting American involvement in the process of changing him, uh, he wasn't he wasn't gonna leave quietly Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, and he was behind, he was, he was the major factor behind the Houthi progression. Without him, we wouldn't have seen them in Sana'a or Aden or out, out, outside their, their stronghold in the north. Uh, but it was also significant how they survived killing him. You know, when they killed him, they are in control. There isn't, there isn't much of, of, the, of his people's or the general people's Congress, his party's uh, resistance. We see that in politics. We see that, we, you know, we see them uh, staying in, in government or in parliament, but not in, in terms of having military presence uh, in, in, in the north, even even members of, of his family like Tariq Saleh, famously again a UAE backed uh, mission, hasn't delivered much in terms of fighting the Houthis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would like to throw it open for questions from the audience. And again, um, if, you'd, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and, and we'll get the microphone to you. Um, yes, sir. And when you get the microphone, if you could identify yourself, appreciate it. John, du <clears throat> John Duke Anthony, National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. On the global aspect of AQAP, where do you see uh, direction, center, headquarters, focus, guidance? I mean, you never read about Zawahiri or Bora Bora or anything like that in the media. So um, uh, what's happened to them? Uh, Secondly, you mentioned uh, a bloody nose being given by Iran to Saudi Arabia. It's difficult for an outsider to see how uh, Tehran would not be quite delighted with what Congress has just done, uh, because this is a blow um, giving Saudi Arabia a bloody nose of, of a different kind, perceptually, in terms of the optics. Uh, of course, the president has vetoed it. Uh, might you comment on um, or answer, respond to those two questions? Did you have anyone in, that directed to anyone? And Alec, yeah. So your question on global, where do you think the focus will return to? I think I think still, um, kind of what we've what we've seen before with the. The ones who've been trained by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and attacks in Europe, I still think generally the West, Europe, and the United States will still remain priorities. Whether that's striking U.S. interests in, in closer areas to them, whether it's you know turn to things like embassies or that, not necessarily on on U.S. soil, but I think attacks on U.S. soil will always be something that they would would strive for. Um, we've seen all of the attempts in the past, but I think generally uh, European and, and American interests wherever and whenever they can. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a good answer. Uh, 
I mean, I agree with you that the Iranians obviously pay attention to what's happening in terms of U.S.-Saudi relations. But how much space do they have to operate on the question of whether they can exploit that situation? I mean, they're, they're ideologically put themselves in a horrible position where they really, their hands are tight. They can't use that as a way of sort of making overtures to the United States. And the same is truly for the Saudis. They've kind of put themselves in, a, in, in that horrible uh, position, although they were, I noticed the Iranian media were covering that veto and what was happening in terms of, they've been covering the overall, the sort of, if you will, uh, lack of fortune for the Saudis in this town for the last few months. They've done that, the Iranian media has, eagerly, but that doesn't mean the officials in Tehran have an any idea in terms of how you can exploit it to what end. If you, right now, you have a president who came to power in Tehran in 2013 with the promise of overturning you know, bad blood between Iran and the Gulf states. In terms of practical steps, nothing has really been done. You could argue the other side hasn't really done anything either. But that's where we are. And then you have a supreme leader who arguably is the man who you want to watch above all, Ayatollah Khamenei, who, who in his latest Persian New Year speech singled out one country that is Iran's enemy. I mean, that wasn't Israel. It was Saudi Arabia. So in terms of vision, I, I you know, if that's where you are, You've always had America as the big boogeyman. You blame everything on the United States, and that's been true since 1979. And now you really harden your position of the Saudis. They're, they're you know, your number one regional uh, enemy. And the fact that these two are having problems, how can Tehran exploit it? But the fact is they're in a position they haven't been able to exploit it. And that that is, I think, a shortcoming of their, their foreign policy, if you will, of, or the kind of terrible ideological limbo to put themselves in. and. Iran as a country continues to pay the consequences for this. Thank you. Uh, James Barnett, Critical Threats Project. Thank you for a terrific presentation. Um, my question's mostly directed, I think, at uh, Mr. Jabori. I was wondering, and uh, you touched on this a bit, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the uh, recent parliamentary session in, in Sayoun and how Jermout and um, the prospects for, or lack thereof possibly, of dealing with the Southern question in Parliament. And I guess more specifically, whether the STC or any other Southern actors are perhaps kind of recalibrating their strategy um, to, to agitate for, you know, on the Southern issue based on the fact that we now have a legislative venue uh, to, to discuss these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at least the STC um, was and has been vehemently against the session uh, and the initiative, uh, and against many initiatives um, of the of the present Hadi's uh, government. So I think uh, I think the answer to the southern question uh, is not this this parliament session. Uh, it took place uh, tellingly in Seoul in an area that was that is under the more Saudi influence than as opposed to southern Hadramaut where the Emiratis uh, have the influence uh, and and of course it wasn't held in Aden uh, so that says a lot about uh, you know the STC's rejection to the, the whole notion of uh, Parliament being held uh, as it had I think it's more as as I highlighted it's it's more about uh, you know, uh, 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 countering the Houthis' uh, initiative of, of 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 shaping their own parliament in in, in Sanaa. Um, I don't see um, anything happening that would satisfy the STC um, with 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 these uh, with these uh, uh, you know with these whole initiatives. I think it will. For the time being, it will be it will be part of anything anything that they would agree to would be part of um, would 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 be subject to the UAE endorsement. I think, I a, I'm sorry. You I have to, a, a few kind of okay. Go for it. Points to to add. Um, I also think it's it's interesting that 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 session happened not too long after the SC, STC held their national assembly and everything like that. And one thing that the STC is also doing, um, well, between the Hadi government and the STC, they've been going kind of back and forth trying to, the government's been trying to set up things to rival the Southern Transition <clears throat> Council. They set up their own little Southern political body for a short period of time that 
hasn't seemed to have gone anywhere, but it's this back and forth of there are the Southern Transitional Council's organized enough to hold a large national assembly. We need to show that we're functioning enough and we'll hold something as well. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting to look at too, how they've been going back and forth trying to challenge one another's power and, and ability to govern and their support that they have within the Southern government. And it's also one more thing. There is a, st a story that I'll tell quickly, uh, not confirmed, but very significant, about an old colleague of Aydarus Zubaydi, the chairman of the STC, who uh, supposedly spoke with him recently about, you know, not being able to deliver the ultimate goal of the secessionist movement, which is secession. And again, supposedly, Aydarus Zubaydi answered that he, you know, last time he spoke with the with the UAE government about that, about about that there was anger and vehement uh, rejection from from theirs, and there was also, again, according to that narrative, there was a threat that. Uh, the family members of the STC and Southern Movements members who are who live actually in in the United Arab Emirates uh, would be used as a card against them. You know, by ex ex UAE would use the families, the family, their families' existence uh, and presence in the UAE as as a card against any any uh, any attempt uh, to uh, take a kind of independent path. Any other questions, Glenn? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and uh, very much appreciate your patience and your interest uh, in uh, the tragic situation. It continues to unfold in Yemen and Jamestown has been very proud to try to bring together a group of experts. We hope to see you again. Uh, and thank you to Michael Ryan for moderating this panel and all our other uh, moderators and participants in the conference today. So we'll be posting this video online after the conference, so look for it uh, and be sure to tweet it when you get a chance. Thank you. Thank you for coming.